I'm in Nehemiah chapter 2, and these are just some quick little messages I had in Nehemiah. But in Nehemiah chapter 2, he's about to approach the king with a request to go back and build the wall and gates of Jerusalem. And we can learn a lot by seeing how he goes about it and how he prepares to do this great work. And I want to use his story to illustrate how we should go back to the scriptures and build our Bible knowledge. So look at Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 1. Nehemiah 2 and verse 1. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. See, Nehemiah is the king's cupbearer. And he says, Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. You weren't supposed to be sad in front of the king. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. And said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulcher, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. So he's sad because he's heard about Jerusalem and how it's just in shambles. And he goes to the king. He's the king's cupbearer. He goes to the king, and the king's like, why is your countenance sad? You weren't supposed to be sad in front of the king. So when the king finds out he's sad, Nehemiah's freaking out because you can be killed for that. And the king says, for what dost thou make request? And the first thing he, is, he does is he prays. It says, so I pray to the God of heaven. So the first thing you need to do in your preparation to learn the Bible, get full of Bible knowledge, is pray instantly without ceasing. You know, when I open the Bible, I pray instantly. Before you start reading, send up a quick prayer. Before you start studying, send up a quick prayer. Just be, and that's how you talk to God. And it's like Him talking back to you at the same time because you're reading the Scriptures. You can read some verses and then talk to the Lord about it, and then read some more verses, and then talk to the Lord about it. It's like you're having your own conversation there. So pray instantly without ceasing. And one of the things you should pray for is being pleasing in the presence of authority. You see, Nehemiah had never been sad in the presence of the king, and he wanted to be pleasing in his sight. Nehemiah approaches the king to make his request. And before he even explains his request, he shows that he's instant in prayer. Just like in Romans 12, 12. In Romans 12, 12, it says, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. See, continuing to do that. Continuing instant in prayer. Nehemiah knew that the way to the king's heart is through the Lord. You know, Nehemiah answered to the Lord, but he was still under that king's authority. And he wanted to be pleasing in the presence of authority. And the heart of the king is moved by the Lord himself. And Nehemiah knew that. Proverbs 21 and verse 1. In Proverbs 21 and verse 1, it says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water he turneth it whithersoever he will. The heart of you is in the hand of the Lord. The heart of the wickedest man on the world is in the hand of the Lord. He turns it whithersoever he will. For this reason, Paul, the Apostle Paul, New Testament, our Apostle, says that we need to pray for kings and for all that are in authority 
that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. 1 Timothy 2.2 2 is where that's at. You see, many Christians in the world today and of the past, they don't have the same privilege of the Scriptures, having the Scriptures everywhere they go with them at all times because it's illegal to have the Scriptures. Many people have died over the Scriptures. Uh, part of preparation in anything we do is to pray that the Lord will soften the hearts. And Job twenty three sixteen says it's God that makes the heart soft. You need to soft get the pray that God will soften the hearts of any resistance you might have in terms of getting the work done and proclaiming the word from the housetops. You know we got it good right now. They may not like the Bible. They may hate the Bible. They may correct it they may put it down but they're not taking it away from you yet and many times i've prayed for the lord to give me the time the opportunity the liberty and supplies i needed to spend hours and hours building a working knowledge of the bible because he says grow in grace and in the knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ and we should thank god daily that we have liberty to study the bible together without being persecuted jailed or killed so Nehemiah comes to the king. He's sad. The king can see that he's sad. Something's bothering him. He says, what do you make requests for? And he just goes instant in prayer. Now look at Nehemiah again. Nehemiah 2 and verse 5. He said, you know, what do you make requests for? He goes instant in prayer. And then it says, and I said, Nehemiah says, and I said unto the king, if it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight. You see how Nehemiah talks to his authority figures in his life. That thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. So the king's like, well, how long will the journey be? And when are you going to come back? So Nehemiah sets him a time. So that goes back to you getting in the scriptures and building a working knowledge of the Bible. Nehemiah's going back to build a wall. You're going to go build a knowledge of the Bible. You need to set a time. So that's the next thing. Pick a date to finish by. Precisely how much time do you want to spend? After Nehemiah explains his request, the king asks Nehemiah, how long is the journey going to be? Nehemiah sets a time. And we need to be mindful of time. Ephesians 5.16 talks about redeeming the time. Colossians 4.5 talks about redeeming the time. Part of preparation has to do with a realistic goal of when to accomplish something. You want to have plans, goals, due dates, and be organized to stay on track, even though studying the scriptures is a lifelong thing and priority that you're going to do until you die. You can still set goals and due dates to accomplish things within a certain time. Imagine a goal of studying one Bible chapter per week and one biblical topic per week. By the end of the year, you've built some Bible knowledge on 52 chapters and 52 topics. Do this 20 years and you've covered a major portion of the scripture. I encourage you to organize a Bible reading plan, a scripture memory goal, and be reasonable, not overdriving yourself. It's not about numbers. It's about continuing in the Scriptures. And here's some verses about it. Continuing in the Scriptures every day. In Psalm 119.11, it says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. You're hiding that word in your heart, and you're building. You're building. You're building your working knowledge of the Bible when you hide the Word of God in your heart. In Deuteronomy seventeen nineteen, 
it says, And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. So he, the king was to make his own copy of the law and then read it therein all the days of his life. Joshua 1.8 In Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8 it says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So day and night, night and day, you're in the scriptures, you're setting realistic goals. Make a goal, you know, I'm gonna, you're going to study a certain book of the Bible and you're going to have it done by this date. Pick a date to finish by. Precisely how much time do you want to spend? Pray instantly while you do it. Now here's the next thing. Look at Nehemiah chapter 2 again. Nehemiah 2 verse 7. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king... Let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come unto Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertain to the house and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. So Nehemiah is getting permission from the king he's going to have the heavenly father the heavenly father the heavenly king's permission and he's got this earthly king's permission and he's going to get it in writing even and he's even going to get him to uh, get this guy asaph to get him the supplies he needs to do it so that's the third thing is pick out your supplies anytime that you go to build your Bible knowledge, you're going to have to pick out your supplies. And you need protection from the outside. So Nehemiah needed the king to send Asaph a letter uh, requesting timber for the wall. And walls were a source of defense, especially before aircrafts came along. You know, walls were a huge source of defense. Nehemiah needed the right supplies to fix the problem. And you're going to need the right supplies to fix your problem. And the scripture is the authority. That's the first thing you need. You need the scriptures themselves. You need to make sure you have a King James Bible. You need to have a library of sound doctrine. Titus 2.1 talks about sound doctrine. You want to make sure that the people that you're listening to and learning from, have sound doctrine. Titus 2, 1, bespeak thou the things which become sound doctrine. It's important. Uh, don't just hang, uh, listen to somebody and absorb everything they're saying because it sounds so good when they're saying it. Make sure they got sound doctrine. You need men who can teach others also. 2 Timothy 2, 2. You know, you have a shield of faith, Ephesians 6.16, for protection from fiery darts. And you need to focus on making it bigger and bigger. That's your protection from the outside. And you can build a barrier around you with the Word of God because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10.17. It's like the more you hear it and read it, the, your faith, your shield just gets thicker and thicker. So you need protection from the outside. You need supplies for that. You need palace gates. Keep your palace gates in mind. In Nehemiah 2, 8, over in Nehemiah 2 and verse 8, he said, And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace. So you need palace gates. You need to keep your palace gates in mind. Ne Nehemiah knew he needed beams for the gates. He knew everything he would need to build the wall back. 
He also knew Asaph was the man to ask. You need to know, you need to find out the right teachers and the teachers that have sound doctrine to know where to get your supplies from. Revelation 3.20 talks about how the Lord stands at the door of the church and knocks. And the devil has already huffed and puffed and blew down the door of most churches. So you need to have a sturdy door that welcomes the Lord Jesus Christ and keeps the devil out. Neither give place to the devil. You're going to have to pick out the right supplies for your place of entry. Or you'll, you'll end up letting in the wolves. You'll end up letting in the evil beasts, the pigs, the dogs, and anything that creeps into houses and lead captive silly women, 2 Timothy 3, 6. And novices who are taken captive by him at his will, 1 Timothy 3, 6. Um, so part of picking out the right supplies is knowing where to go. Nehemiah knew to go to Asaph. You should know which Bible to get. You should know which commentaries to glean from. You should know which pastors and teachers are best at perfecting the saints. Ephesians 4.12 Some of the best places to go to learn is places I've found like Pastor Bevan's Welder my3bc.com huge library of stuff to help you build your wall of Bible knowledge. Pastor Bob Alexander of Old Pass Baptist Church Keys to the Bible is his website. You can build a huge wall of Bible knowledge there. Pastor David Hoffman, the Common Man's Reference Bible. It will help you so much going through a chapter just in so many references to take and compare Scripture with Scripture. Get a Ruckman Reference Bible. Go to the Bible Baptist Bookstore. Get uh, commentaries, all kinds of commentaries. The Now Now the End Begins Bookstore. The NTEB, Now the End Begins Bookstore. Look that up. All kinds of good material in there that does not correct the Bible. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for stuff that doesn't correct the Bible and approaches the Bible like the Bible's right and they're wrong and they're looking for the Bible to fix them and not the other way around. That's the stuff that's going to help you build the wall. And But first and foremost, get you a King James Bible. And there's King James Bibles out there for cheap. You can get one at the Dollar Tree. They got King James Bibles at the Dollar Tree. They don't have wide margins, obviously, but they've got all kinds of notepads in there. Get you a King James Bible and get you a bunch of notepads and there's your wide margin Bible on a budget. If you got a little bit more money on that Now the End Begins bookstore, they got a Common Man's Reference Bible and they got Ruckman Reference Bibles. The paperback and the hardback, which are a lot cheaper, under $30, I believe. And you can go in there, look at those references along along the center column as you read. Look at those notes as you read, and you're going to build your Bible knowledge. You know the right places to go. Nehemiah knew to go to Asaph. You know to get you a King James. And now you know which commentaries to glean from. Commentators that believe the scriptures. Now the next thing, Nehemiah 2.10. Nehemiah 2 and verse 10, it says, we'll look at 2.9, Then I came to the governors beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. So he's got letters from the king. He's got some of the king's people. It says, When Samballot the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. So, the next thing is you need to push back the pushback. Because people are going to resist the work. Samballot and Tobiah heard that someone was seeking the welfare of Jerusalem, 
And they weren't happy about it. It grieved them. They're going to run into people like that. You're going to have people constantly withstanding you. And Paul warns about men who withstood his words in 2 Timothy 3.15. These people are going to attempt to stop the work before it even starts. And when you're starting to build, you're starting to build your wall, go ahead and push back any other pushback. Don't take much thought in their words. You now Ecclesiastes 7, over there in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 20, it says, For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Also take no heed unto all words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee. Don't spend so much time worrying about every little thing that's said. Don't be afraid of their faces. Jeremiah 1.8 Consider yourself blessed to suffer shame for his name. Acts 5.41 It's good to suffer for well-doing. 1 Peter 3.17 If you're building a wall of Bible knowledge, you're going to run into Bible correctors. You're going to run into these false teachers, false prophets, these guys that they have a ministry of just bugging people and ruining everybody else's ministry. You run into that. And discouragers along the way who are grieved simply by the fact that you believe what you read. Just continue to build and grow anyhow. Second Peter 3.18 Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now back to Nehemiah. Nehemiah 2.11 It says, So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And I arose in the night. I and some few men with me Neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me, save the beast that I rode upon. So privacy is a key. Nehemiah said, Neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Before he started the work, he was scoping things out and preparing quietly. You see, you're already going to face a lot of resistance. And working quietly in the background for the Lord, not making a big promotion of yourself, can be a key in accomplishing things with less attention. You can be doing a great work, getting a lot of things done, and the spotlight doesn't have to be on you. But a temptation for many young Christians, pastors, teachers, ministries, whatever, is heavy self-promotion. And this gets more eyes on you than you even need especially with social media and YouTube, that's a temptation for people. Don't worry about making yourself a name, Genesis 11.4, like they did back there building the Tower of Babel. Just go on working for God, and He will make you a name. Some Baptist cliques have focused on getting their name out. You know who I'm talking about. They have done this by preaching Christ even of envy and strife, Philippians 1.15, like Paul talks about, by de drawing disciples after them, just like in Acts 20.30. And it's just, it's, it's really nasty and obnoxious to see that heavy self-promotion, that cocky, self-righteous attitude, putting other pastors down just to get your name out there. But the world is already grieved by us. And we can seek attention like some Christians have and only end up adding affliction to our bonds. Philippians 1.16 Paul talks about those that add affliction to his bonds by preaching Christ even of envy and strife. And that's what it all goes back to is they're envious and they want to be a diatrophies. It's like in 3 John so they spend all their time attacking and it's all about making themselves a name. But the work itself will get your name out there and promote you in God's time. So privacy is a key. You don't have to just make a big post about it, you see. Now, Nehemiah two thirteen through 17. And it says, And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, and to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. 
Then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Then went I up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and so returned. And the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did, neither did I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. Then said I unto them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Now, through there, he's going through, and he's looking around, and he's pointing out the damages. You need to examine yourselves. You know the verse, how it says, examine yourself. You need, and you need to point out the damages. Put your foot on the problem. Nehemiah views the walls that are broken down and the gates that are burned with fire. In verse 13, and he ends up saying, the city lieth waste. In verse 17, if you're viewing, your, you're looking at yourself like he's looking at that city, most likely a lot of you are going to say, I lieth waste. And Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Israel went into captivity and were destroyed because they became like their idols. And Psalm 115 and verse 8. Look there real quick. Psalm 115 and verse 8. It says, They that make them are likened to them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. And the verse before that says, They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. Like the idols, they, they have feet, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. The idols neither see nor hear nor walk. You've become like your idols. You can't see, you can't hear, you can't walk. When it comes to the scriptures. That's the way people of God are today. When it comes to their Bible. If we're going to build a wall of Bible knowledge. Then it is time to get to work in the scriptures. 1 Timothy 5.17. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 17 says. Charge them that are rich in this world. Hang on that's 6.17. 1 Timothy 5.17 says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So you labor in the word and doctrine. Much studies a weariness to the flesh. But 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So, if you're going to go back and build, examine the damages. Just like Nehemiah did. Just like Nehemiah did back there in Nehemiah chapter 2. Look what he did. He said in, uh, in verse 13, I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, and to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down. Can you admit to yourself that you're broke down? You're broke down on the side of the road. And he said, And the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Can you admit that you've been burnt out? Maybe you got burnt out and you just quit doing what you knew to be right. And then, it said, then he says, And I went, out, went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Then went I up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and so returned. So can you just look around your life, examine yourself, see what needs to be fixed. And if you're going to prepare to build then go back and look at the damages, you can see you've put your Bible on the shelf. You've not perfected that which is lacking. 1 Thessalonians 3.10, Paul talks about perfecting that which is lacking in your faith. So 
Maybe you've self-destructed your wall. And the gates are bent open. And you can't even get them back shut from where maybe you gave place to the devil. And the gates are just bent open. Paul says in Ephesians 4.27, Neither give place to the devil. So, point out the damages. Put your foot on the problem. And Nehemiah, the next thing, he pricked the hearts of the people. In Nehemiah 2, 17 through 18, it says, Then said I unto them, You see the distress that we are in. He's saying, you know, look around. How Jerusalem lieth waste. That's a lot of people's Christian service. That's a lot of people's own personal walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. It just lieth waste. And the gates thereof are burned with fire. He says, Come, and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. So he pricked the hearts of the people. Nehemiah tells the people the distress and the waste that he's seen. He reminds them of their reproach. He points out all the damage he discovered when he viewed the area. And uh, you can't bring the body back to the Bible on your own. You see, you got to have, you, you got to prick the hearts of the people out there in the jungle and get them back in the Bible. They've been out in the jungle, now it's time to get back to the Bible. Then you help each other build. Hebrews 10, 24, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. A lot, of, a lot of people don't provoke unto love and to good works because they don't want anybody else working. They want to be the one on the top. They think they're getting ahead of everybody. But Nehemiah pricked the hearts of the people until they said, let us rise up and build. You want to turn people's attention to the scriptures to the point of persuading them to build a library of Bible knowledge not a knowledge that puffeth up, which Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, but a knowledge built on a true, genuine, sincere love for the Scriptures. Puffy knowledge gets blown over like a cloud by any Sanballat and Tobiah. So the conclusion is, Let's look at Nehemiah 2, 19 through 20. But when Sinbalat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we his servants will arise and build but ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. You see, they just want to sit back and laugh. Laugh you to scorn, despise you. Accuse you of rebelling against the king. Calling evil good and good evil. You're doing a thing for God. You got the king's permission. You got the heavenly king's permission. And they got the nerve to say you're rebelling against the king. But since something in Christians desire the sincere milk of the word, 1 Peter 2, 2, you can explain to them the need for going back and building or rebuilding their Bible knowledge, and you'll have some want to rise up and build. But you'll run into people like this, the Sanballat and Tobiah, who are just going to laugh and despise you. Lost people are going to scoff, 2 Peter 3, 3. They don't understand the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 2.14, you know, the natural man doesn't get it, so they have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in this matter anyway, just like Sanballat and Tobiah over there in Nehemiah 2.20. The Bible correctors are going to laugh. They're going to make fun of you for believing the scriptures. They're going to think you're just outdated and silly. 
They're going to make fun of your strange doctrines, as they say. But you just prepare to build, getting your equipment, and determining yourself that you're going to rise up and build.